Tree nonprofit dedicated to the inspiration of young people. It's our belief that anything is possible through human connection. It may sound simple, but it is powerful. And one has three distinct lines of support. <clears throat> We're on campuses where we provide uh, lunchtime drop-in. We provide meetings on Monday night where kids come for connection. It is not a 12-step meeting, it is not therapy, but it's probably one of the most therapeutic things teenagers will ever experience. All right, am I good? Yep, okay. So, um, and we're also, um, one of the things we do on campus that is really important is uh, they call it now restorative practice. It used to be called restorative justice. Uh, it's an alternative to suspension. And to let you know, we call it the one exchange, and it's probably the program I'm most proud of because it means any adolescent who commits or student who commits an infraction punishable by suspension has the option, and I always like to put this caveat for schools, in most cases, Okay, I'm covered. Um, in most cases, to exchange that suspension, to let it be stayed, if they attend eight consecutive one meetings. In those one meetings, we use arts, film, music. We create space for conversation to occur. If a student got caught, let's say, vaping, whether it's nicotine or it's cannabis, uh, whether they were bullying, whatever the suspendable act is, we ask the school to please stay and give them the opportunity. Because what we do is we bring those kids together in a room where they get to be adolescents in the stage of development where they're meant to make mistakes. At one, we believe adolescence is a stage of development. It's not a diagnosis. In this world today, <clears throat> I take responsibility in my generation. If you're in my generation, which I don't think anyone is. <laughs> okay, maybe some of our panel members, sorry. Uh, Right. Well, yeah, it is true. But I take responsibility for the fact that the kids today have it really hard. They have it really hard. And when I was young and I was able to scream like most of us were at our parents and say, you don't understand me. Right. Every generation has that option to scream in your parents and say, you don't understand. Well, I'm going to tell you this, this generation is the first generation to be right. We don't. They have social media. They have the pandemic. They have the opioid epidemic. They have school shootings. We've created a world where it really doesn't feel safe. And back in the day when my parents would tell me they did understand, I kind of knew they did. I kind of knew they did. It was a different time. And so for the kids wanting to check out, get high, vape, uh, isolate, get lost in social media, never feel good enough, compare themselves to the filtered others, it's a rough time. And as parents, I want to say this to us, because I am a parent first, it's a rough time. It's a hard time to be a parent. Because again, maybe when you were young and you said, I just want to die, our parents would be like, oh, stop being so dramatic. And sadly, when kids say it now, they might be serious. So as a parent, this is a hard path to navigate. This panel that's brought together tonight, and I want to give a shout out to the Department of Mental Health of Los Angeles. I think many times we are willing to talk about what's wrong in the city of LA or what's wrong everywhere. Well, I'll tell you what's right is that they created a grant so we could do these awareness panels. And if you go to takeactionlac.com, all through the month of May, which is Mental Health Month, there are events all across the county the most amazing, interesting events. It actually will restore your faith in people that there's like an opera about mental health happening at UCLA. There's marches, there's parades, there's all sorts of ways to get involved and just raise our awareness. Because what I believe and what the core of one is, is we are early intervention through human connection. If a teenager is still breathing and participating, even in life, to wake up, we still have a chance to intervene. 
So what I want you to know is that this panel was made possible, and it is the program called Take Action for Mental Health LA County. Some people saw it last night at Dodger Stadium. They're blasting this everywhere, and as well they should. But I do want you to know that, like, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles County. This is my state. This is my city. And it really is a city of angels. We get a bad rap. But there are a lot of good people in this city doing a lot of good work, and there's a lot of people that really care about your kids. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, because the last thing we want to do as parents is come back out after you got to go back in. And so those of you that came out tonight, thank you. Those of you that are on the live stream, I want to thank you. And also know that this will be recorded, so anybody that you know that may miss this will be able to see it on the One on Campus uh, YouTube channel. So I don't want to introduce the panel. I want one of our board members, Dr. Don Grant, who I can never say everything Don does because if you go on our website, it's a lot. Like he was the 2022 president of Division 46 of the American Psychological Association, which is like it has, you know, it's about social media, but I'm going to get the title wrong and then he's going to tell me later. And he's also one of the only media psychologists in the nation. He is an expert. He was just featured last week in Time Magazine. The day he was featured in Time Magazine on an article about social media, he got in his car and came over here to knock on the door of the office to say, would you please, please hand out our flyers? We really want the support of the campus. That's Dr. Don Grant. Everybody on this panel is somebody that you could ask a question, you could ask something from, and they're going to give you a genuine answer. All those community partners out there, and I want to name them, Destinations for Recovery, BNI, Teens for Teens, Mission Prep, which is a part of AM, FM, uh, Arrow, which is an adolescent project, and boy, it is, right? Yeah. And Visions, um, who's very dear to my heart and has been around a very long time and does quality work with teenagers, and Brass Tax Recovery and Newport Healthcare. You know, there are programs out there ready to help your kids. And here tonight I have Elisa, who um, was my ambassador. Stand up. Come on. She's, not a uh, she's my ambassador at Corona Del Mar High School. And... Um, you know, she came to the program, maybe not like totally willingly, right? Like you weren't like, yeah, okay. Monday nights with Lynn, exciting. Um, but now this girl went to college. She is here for the summer. And she, while she was taking her calculus, right before she took her calculus final, she sends me a text, hey, I'm coming. Can I come work for one this summer? And I'm like, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You are an amazing example. And I'm so proud of you. And Jasmine Butler is running around here making sure everything happens for us. And, um, and that's what she does every day. There's people involved with one. And there are panel members here that are on our board. And um, just know I'm proud to be from Los Angeles. I'm grateful to have received this grant so we could provide this to you. And uh, I'm also really grateful that Dr. Don Grant is going to moderate this panel tonight. So you're going to get the most out of it because this is me being concise. It's just not, I'm not really that good at it. So Don, without further of my do, will you take this? Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and thank you all for taking time out of their busy week, busy day, busy season. And, uh, you know, Lynn is really good at promoting other people. And what I've always told people about Lynn, and I mean this, get near her, get in her orbit, you will come out better. And I've watched it over and over and over. And that includes the kids. What she can create, doing this. If you knew what was going on, she says, I do a lot. If you knew what she was doing, for all of us and for all the kids and for this community and for her city of Los Angeles and for the world, you wouldn't believe she even had time to do this and put in to get a grant to try to help and spread the word for community. And by the way, what she does, and Lynn, thank you so much. It's an honor to know you. It's an honor to be on your board. And my mother, she's rest in peace, used to say, show me the friends and I'll show you the person. So I don't need to meet the person, show me the friends. That I am her friend. These are her friends, fans, and colleagues. 
if when you hear what they have to say, you will understand everything you need to know about. Lynn, if you don't, go to the website. All right, so I want to really, again, appreciate you coming here. Lynn creates community. This is a community. Hello to our live stream people. One of the benefits of technology is we can do that too. And I want to get right into it, and I want to introduce someone who, whoops, I want to get it right. All right, so Dr. Bob Gabay. Now, I had to really think about this, Bob, because on the way here I was thinking, could I pretend this was a roast? <laughs> no, we're going to be serious. Also, my daughter went to this high school, so I don't even know. There's still like a teacher around here that scares me, so I don't know if they're lurking. Uh, all right, so Dr. Bob Gabay is a graduate of the Geffen UCLA Medical School, as well as the Harbor UCLA General Psychiatry and their Child and Adolescent Fellowship Program. One was not enough for you, Bob? He has extensive experience working with children and families at the Help Group, Penny Lane, Jewish Family Services, and Center for Discovery. For the past 10 years, he has been full-time Chief Medical Director and Attending Physician for Destinations for Teens, which I expect is more than a full-time job. Destinations for Teens delivers evidence-based treatment to adolescents in the intensive outpatient day treatment and residential levels of care. As Lynn said earlier, they're one of the partners tonight. You can talk to them outside. Together, Dr. Bay, with his interdisciplinary treatment team, helps foster long-term improvement in mental health substance use recovery, and family relationships. He's also, I love this part, he's also a huge fan of comic book movies, and he is nonpartisan, Marvel and DC. So bravo to you, you're crossing the aisle on that. And 1980s popular music, and I'm imagining that includes disco? A little bit. Right on. His family has been known to chuckle on more than one occasion at his Spotify music list. I need to see that later. Maybe share it. He is honored to speak to you this evening and be invited, and I am honored to introduce my colleague, my friend, and a respected member of this community, Dr. Bob Gabay. You go, Iron Man. Thank Too you. Soon. Um, okay, so tonight's about connections, and I'm blessed to have many connections here tonight that span decades. Um, Lynn, I don't know how long ago we met, um, when I was just a little baby psychiatrist, <laughs> fresh out of UCLA. Um, I worked for a colleague of Lynn, Dr. Brian Holt, and that's how I got to meet Lynn at Center for Discovery. That laid the groundwork for the work that I'm doing today in the past 10 years for being at Destinations for Teens, where I've been really been able to really use all my energy and resources to see teenagers um, and not and maybe a few preteens and adults. So I'm very blessed to be here. I've been blessed to meet Dr. Don Grant on several occasions, Dr. Tim Fong, who's not here. I'm sure I'm channeling some of what I've learned from them because I've just I'm always taking and incorporating what I hear from my mentors um, who have come before me and who continue to educate me. Um, so tonight we are it's focusing on several topics, social media, mental health, recovery, and family work. So this can take hours to go through, but I'm going to try to do a quick introduction. We're not going to do PowerPoint slides, and I might move around a little bit too. Okay, so human survival. What do we need as humans to survive? Food, shelter, water, but we also need connection. Lynn stole my line. So being physically connected really helps us not only deal and cope with stress, anxiety, and depression, but I think the theme that I take away from tonight is how to really minimize loneliness. Because when we are lonely, whether we're adults, children, or teenagers who are focusing on that on tonight, this really exacerbates mental health issues, connections, just functioning day to day. So I really want you all to think about that as the overlying principle, you know, permeating what has happened since COVID, permeating what you see on TV in our schools, etc. So let's talk about the positives of social media. It does allow us to communicate with friends and family that we might not otherwise been able to. Even when you had the advent of the telephone and cell phone and you can call grandma long distance on those AT&T or Bell 
commercials, again, it allows people to connect. Without social media, you wouldn't have widespread announcements of births, of anniversaries, of weddings, of exchanging photos. This is very valuable. This does help us connect with each other in a healthy way. It also does help us connect in times of distress and sorrow. Um, for me personally, my grandmother passed away this past Friday. And for the family to be able to connect instantaneously, pictures, memories, and allow us to feel connected, allow us to let people know when to gather, when to grieve together, this is amazing. This uh, technology has really helped with that. There is also the concern that if you're living in a rural area, if you're a disadvantaged group, if you're a marginalized group, um, for even individuals with um, transgender issues, LBGTQI, this social media provides them an outlet where they cannot maybe otherwise get the support that they need. I've had several patients at destinations and in private practice that this does provide a lifeline for them to feel connected. So again, this is a powerful tool. Um, and to quote, I guess, a comic book legend, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So let's also talk about the other side of social media. Okay, so big concern, especially coming up, and the APA literally just had a report, American Psychological Association, a few days ago about social media. It is challenging because as adults and teenagers, there is this tendency to constantly compare ourselves to others, whether through filters, whether through falsehoods, and, I, and maybe Don Grant will get into this more. Now, there's also this whole example of FOMO, fear of missing out. If I'm not on my device every second, am I going to lose out on this world? There's just a sheer excessive time spending. You spend, you scroll, you scroll, and your whole day has gone. It doesn't, I said earlier that social media allows you to feel connected, but for a lot of people, it has the opposite effect. It makes you feel more isolated. It makes you feel more lonely. It makes you feel more shitty about your life in many ways. Um, and you can become more depressed if you're not socially connected. So why is this important for teenagers and adolescents? So um, part of this talk is the youth um, survey from 2021, which is part of the reason we got the grant. Um, and according to that, there has been an uptick in cyberbullying. Six in 2021, 16% of high school students were electronically bullied through texting, Instagram, Facebook, other social media. Um, and unfortunately, it, it, it was on, in all age groups, uh, females, males, all ethnic groups. So it's not codified or specific to one group. Um, and then let's take a step further when we're talking about adolescence. As adults, we have some filter. We're able to sort of think back, reflect. But adolescents, their brains are still developing. A lot of people, your brains take forever to develop. But the general trend is it really takes until the age of 22 to 25 to really have these social skills to sort of think back, project yourself in someone else's shoes, and really filter yourself before losing your temper. But again, this all changed with the iPhone and social media and Facebook, which I'll get into in a moment. And you're de dealing with teenagers who are already struggling to on the one hand become more independent, but at the other hand, they still need to be connected to their families. And again, there's a continuum use. So we're not saying that social media is inherently bad, but there is the aspect of how much are you using and how involved and absorbed are you. So um, something that I learned, which I knew a little bit, but this, this sort of re reinvigorated me is that if we look at historical data literally from 1976 to 2004, teenagers spent sort of the same amount of time year after year with their families and with their friends outside of their home. So again, but then this started decreasing in 2004 and then it really started decreasing in 2012. And it got worse even during COVID-19. So again, what are the factors that led to that? Um, 
Historically, people have sounded the alarms. Oh, if you have comic books, if you have TV, if you have cable, if you have VCR, if you have video games, you know, it's going to ruin all our lives. And I think we weather those storms, but I think social media is a bit more complicated. So let's talk about Facebook. So Facebook did allow us to have a little bit of an experiment. Um, I don't know if any of you recall, but Facebook was not rolled out instantaneously. It was rolled out specifically only on college campuses for two years before you could have, it was available to the public. So again, you had to have a .edu email address to even qualify for Facebook. And immediately in campuses where Facebook was introduced, you did see an uptick in depressive symptoms. Very similar to losing a job, being fired from work, really giving a fail in a class. So they did start seeing at student health centers, through surveys that schools had to actually do anyway. So you sort of had this semi-natural experiment that you had different colleges who were introducing Facebook compared to ones who doesn't. And this has continued over time with all the fancy algorithms to try to keep all of us hooked and absorbed. Um, the, and the interesting sort of psychological component of this is with social media, it's not just that you're just sort of watching pictures or videos, but you do get absorbed by things about the, you know, having the like button, wanting to post, having the screen refresh. Again, it's like going to Las Vegas. You need that little boost of little energy or feel good feeling or technically dopamine in your brain, which I heard this from Dr. Grant, so I'm taking that from him. But again, it is intoxicating. You go to, if you go gamble or you go to Vegas, you're not going to win every single time. But this sensation of social media really activating your brain, it's natural. Why wouldn't you want to be involved in social media? It feels good. But again, this has a lot of negative effects for teenagers. Their brains are growing. It's disrupting their sleep. It's disrupting their appetite. And in many ways, social media is a little bit more concerning than traditional media because teenagers are learning ways to cut, to really have suicide glorified in some unfortunate cases, in advertising use of illicit drugs. Um, and a lot of restrictive eating disorder behaviors, restrictive eating and binge, binging and purging. Um, so it's very concerning. Um, you know, we've seen trends, so this is not in a vacuum. From two, Again, the 2021 survey from 2011 to 2021, you do, you do see an uptick in not, not even depression, persistent feelings of sadness. So this is, this is real world stuff. To have a whole decade that you're consistently, persistently sad, again, this is worrisome. 2021, 22% of high school students seriously considered attempting suicide over the previous 12 months. 18% made an actual suicide plan. That is why all of us are in the business that we're in, because we are really trying to help these individuals. And I think for many of us here, 3% actually had a suicide attempt that necessitated receiving medical attention. So think about that. 3%, 3 out of 100 kids. Think about that if you have a high school that has 200, 400, 600, 1,000 kids. These are real individuals. These are real families. These are real hospitalizations. So how do we address the problem? How do we take social media in a larger issue? So I want to take a step back. When we all evaluate and treat kids, my, my sort of take, and I, I'm curious what the panel think, is everything's a symptom. You see someone come in, they come in, I see them as a complete person, and how do I help them out? In many cases, I do think the social media is a symptom of how do you cope with life? People are getting something from social media that they might lack. And again, in some situations, if it's excessive use, if it's to check out, if it's to not speak to their family, if it's not talking about their feelings, I would sort of mirror what Lynn said earlier. I don't think it's the kids that are saying also you don't understand. I think it's the kids not even talking to their parents or their families and talking to what's on this phone. 
Um, and these phones have become, again, it's, it's almost ubiquitous. Um, a very, um, you'll be wondering why this hat is here. A very, a very smart individual who's the father of our president and CEO for Destinations once stated that, or I think he said it multiple times, that in a meeting, he would pass a hat around to have individuals put their phones in so that they would be not disturbed. Very interesting concept. How long during this talk tonight can you refrain from looking at your phone or just answering a quick text? Again, this is, it's become part of our lives. Um, it's, it's, how, what do you do? It's, it's almost ingrained. So again, but like very, any other behavior, short term, this, these phones, this social media, it satisfies a lot of things. Like I said earlier, you're going to be late somewhere. You don't have to call someone and wait four rings to pick, have them pick up. You can serve, send a quick text. But again, it becomes too easy, too distracting. You can't multitask. You can't get anything done. So again, this is something to really be concerned about. Um, so I hope this has allowed a broad overview of sort of the landscape. Um, and we're definitely open to the rest of the panel and any questions you have. So thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabay, and everything you said, yes, yes, and yes. All right, so this is a juggernaut topic, right? Uh, I want to say and get a couple of things out of the way. Whoops, I almost forgot. Ooh, what is he doing? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we define terms. And I want you to know I am not anti-technology. I, even if I were, like, what am I going to go do? Live in the one square mile of the planet that has not been developed yet? No, I'm not into technology. I use it all the time. I enjoy it. I've been using it. I don't want to say in the early days I was great at it. I'm getting better. And the fact that we can live stream and there can be people, and what you said, marginalized, remote during the pandemic, thank goodness, what would we have done? But I don't think it will ever replace. And I talk about this a lot, and I say to the kids, you know, you won't know this yet because you don't miss what you don't know. But the covalent bonds of relationships that we all have, and you were talking about this, and Aronson says we are social animals. We are pack. We are. We crave it. We need it. We need touch. We all saw what happened just in one case with those babies in Russia who were not touched. So we need it. But I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to challenge you, maybe you're going to disagree with me, that you can build relationships in a lot of different ways. And you can sustain them. Once you have built a covalent bond of relationship and you sustain it, yeah, that's when all those great things about being able to use social media, they're fantastic as a buttress. My family lives back east. I have family, uh, friends, and colleagues all over the world. I was just working on this incredible international project for a, a journal that's going to be published next year about all of this. And I got to work with people that I would never have been able to work with people who blew me away. I had such imposter syndrome working with these brilliant minds who do what I do around the world. I never would have been able to do that without technology. Yes, my Zoom meetings were at five o'clock in the morning because they're all in other time zones. And I don't know that I could have done it without it because I don't speak their languages, but we were able to use technology. These are good things. But I don't think in the future it's going to look like, well, I'll say this. When you think about your friendships, you think about your relationships. And I see many people in the room. I see Mary Lou, I see Zoe, I see Corey. I see so many people here that I know. Hi, Savannah and Carolyn. I built relationships with these people. And when we look and we talk, and when Savannah's smiling at me right now, I'm hoping she's thinking about a time when we had fun together, and that's in real life IRL, as the kids say. And when you think about your relationships and you think about your friendships that really matter in your closest orbit, the times that you really built those covalent bonds, I'm going to propose to you where when you laugh together, you cry together, you experience something in real life together. And I do not believe, and maybe you'll think I'm wrong, that in the future, any of the generations of kids are going to be sitting around saying or texting 
or whatever they'll be in virtual reality avatars. Hey, remember that time when Steve sent us that GIF that was so hilarious? It's not going to happen. So, I'm not into technology, but I want to do something first. I want to define terms. Because I'm talking about devices. I do not teach anti-technology. I teach healthy device management and the practice of good digital citizenship. And for the good digital citizenship part, I'm going to make it real simple. What I tell families, what I tell kids, I say, okay, sit around family, talk about your family values of how you expect to behave in real life with people. Not in online disinhibition effect behind a screen where a lot of bad things happen, including cyberbullying. And this is a big thing. We'll talk about it if I have a couple minutes later. Talk about your family values. How would you expect yourself or your kids, and you need to model this behavior, parents, educators, clinicians, practitioners. How would you expect them to behave in real life? And to me, I've not heard a reason yet why that should not be absolutely mirrored online. All right. So I want, and if it's not, I say to the kids, why is your online persona different than your one in real life? And adults, we do it too. All right, so, so if I asked you what's a device, when I say device, because we're talking, we call them phones, really? We had a phone when I was growing up. It was beige. It hung on the wall in our kitchen. No, it did not have the buttons. We were not fancy. We got the basic plan, and my mother designed the whole kitchen around that beige phone. She did her best. We had a phone. We call them phones, are they? They're everything, and they're only going to get more. And they're not even going to be phones in the future. Sorry, not sorry. They're going to be chips. So what's a device? Anyone? A device is everything, isn't it? I'm worried in the future, uh, Android much? Cyborg? We're going to be devices. Not yet. Everything. A refrigerator. There's a screen on it. Really? Do I need to see that? I'm going to eat that ice cream. No matter what you say, so shut up, screen. I'm talking to a little round cylinder that is the first real iteration of mainstream AI. And when Alexa, I don't want to say her name, she wakes up, she's everywhere. I find myself talking to a cylinder that I know. And if she doesn't comply, I start getting angry. And I'm not an angry person. And at a certain point, I'm like, Alexa, will you please like just shut down? Uh, and she doesn't. I'm like, Alexa, <laughs> would you please shut down? No. Now she's like my children, like she doesn't hear me. Alexa, shut up. And then I feel shame. And I'm a pop. I'm so sorry, Alexa. It's okay, Don. Would you like to hear a joke? Yes. Are we good? To a cylinder. Imagine what it's going to be in the future. All right. So devices, everything. Everything. Phones, watches, laptops. Okay. I'm going to ask you something else. Digital immigrant. Digital native, can anyone tell me the difference between these two? Anyone? Bueller, anyone? Oh, oh, you're going to make, I don't have a good pitching arm, I'll try. Oh, okay. <laughs> Was I being, okay. So, what is a digital immigrant? Clue. Yes, the ones who had maybe that phone on the wall, or maybe a little later. I know. Remember when you used to like pull it and you're afraid you were like, pulling it outside the house around the corner and like your mom's like, what is, oh, they could always, see, they could always find us. So that was the problem. Smartphones and phones, they, we can't find our kids. They're everywhere. With that cord, it was just follow the cord. Where, where is he? Where is he? And it was so shady. If you were talking to someone like outside the house, stretching the cord, mom always found us. What is a digital native? Correct. Oh, God, you're really going to do this? Oh. Uh, oh, not bad! Hey, hey, hey. That wasn't bad. I got lucky. All right. Yes, digital immigrant. That's me. Digital native, my children. And I'm going to tell you, this is the only time in human history ever that the digital natives and the digital immigrants will cohabitate this planet. Once we're gone and we've abdicated, I'm afraid they won't even know how to do this. And we have a lot to learn from them because I... I'm not, afraid, I'm not proud when I have to say to my kid, okay, so why is the phone, what, can you help me jailbreak this thing? <sighs> However, social media, this is new. This is new. We didn't understand it. If it's free, you're the product. 
And what Dr. Gabay was saying is true. Mental health in teens was stabilized for decades. And in 2012, this CDC report that came out, we started seeing this crazy, crazy spike that we didn't understand. In 2012, the CDC report and two other reports that are legitimate showed that suddenly anxiety, depression, and self-harm, and suicide, and one is too damn many, were off the charts with no trending up. And as geeky statisticians were like, wait, we didn't get a warning. What happened? I don't know. This is a hypothesis. It is not proven. It's just mine. Does anyone know what happened on June 7th? I'm sorry, June 29th, 2007, for a prize. June, 20, June 29th, 2007. Oh, you studied what happened that day. The world changed. What? iPhone. Whoa. I, oh. Hope the live stream didn't catch iPhone. Book. Yes. People say, when did this happen? When was the inflection point? Well, that's my hypothesis. On June 29th, 2007, the iPhone was released. What was the difference? What did it change? Prize in play. What did it change on that day that will never, ever go back? What did the iPhone do that nothing could do before it of a device? What was that? FaceTime. What is FaceTime a part of? What, what is FaceTime a part of? Thank you, Monica. On June 29th, 2007, the internet became portable. And in my opinion, that changed everything. At the same time, the kids were abdicating from Facebook. They were still on it, but we all went on it. They're like, ew, a boomer, shush. If you say that one more time, you're never getting allowance again. That's the inflection point for me because it became something where now we can all be in absent presence. We can all not have to talk to people and the kids could use every piece of it. Now, I'm going to stop. I'm going to just end it with this and leave you here. When we talk about why in 2012, because in 2000, June 29, 2007, the iPhone made it portable. In 2010, the iPhone 4 was the first front-facing camera. Selfies, anyone? The same year Instagram was launched, 2011 and 12, was Snapchat, and it went from there, and you could migrate these photos to apps very easily. We didn't understand it. We are digital immigrants, and we were afraid of it. The way my dad would say, I don't know how to do you, help you. That's new math. I'm like, Dad, it's the same math. I'm not trying to use an abacus here. So we didn't understand it. We're digital immigrants. We let them do it. We let them design it. We let them play with it. They thought they were designing it. They were not. We now know that the companies that did this, the producers and creators, were leveraging the limbic system in them and their immaturity and their need to belong to accumulate likes and affirmations and all these things that aren't even real and create self-curated personas online and compare and despair and do all of these. And I'm going to tell you, we didn't get it. We should have. It's okay. No one's fault. We didn't get it. We didn't understand it. We let kids design this. You ever seen kids on a playground? It's called Lord of the Flies. There's always going to be a Jack. There's always going to be a Ralph. And there's always going to be a Piggy. And that Piggy's going to get cyberbullied. We let them do it. We didn't understand it. We we're still, all of us, we're still languishing on Facebook. And we didn't get it. And we let them do it. And they became our virtual canaries in the digital coal mines. And we wonder what happened. And I'm going to tell you this, as a parent, parents say, oh, I know what they're doing there. Here, they're sitting right in front of me. I don't know. They're on their phone or whatever they're on. I'm like, are they really? Do you know where they are? If your kid said to you, mom, you know, so I'm going out right now. I'm going to bounce and I'm going to go and to the abandoned coal mines, 15 miles outside of town. And I, there's some kids there. I kind of know them, but I don't, but they seem cool. And I'm going to go play with them and I don't know when I'll be back. But you say, oh, cool. When our kids are on these devices, we don't know where they are. Corporally, they may be sitting right there. They're an absent presence. They're anywhere on this internet with anyone looking for them and they're too immature. So what is the solution? The solution is what I've been talking about a lot. The solution is as parents learn the programs. You didn't give your kids games when they're growing up and you walked into Target. You didn't say, oh, your kid is too. Oh, I'm going to walk into the uh, games for adults aisle. So know what they are. Your kids are playing with these and they're getting harmed. It's how I get into all this a long time ago with my kid. Know what they are. Ask them. Play the digital immigrant card. They'll love it. Say, well, I've been reading all this stuff about social media. I, 
what is this? Is this really a problem? Pretend you don't know. And if you don't know, that makes it even more real. Just say, can you tell me, do you know about this? Has this happened to a kid? Do you know about kids who have hurt themselves or about this tick-tock toe thing where they're teaching you how to self-harm? Do you know about this? Oh, trust me. After you get the proverbial patented teen eye roll, which is karma because you probably gave it to your parents. Guilty. So once you get that, they'll love to teach you something. Those, they love to teach us. Make it gentle. Don't look them in the eye. Do it when you're driving, when you're shopping, when you're doing chores. Say, hey, this stuff I'm seeing on, is this real or is this like hashtag whatever that fake news thing is? And what is that? Let your kids tell you. It will bleed out. You will find out. Also, if your kid is on a device, you don't need to people like, I'll go into their text and go, don't do it. Because if you see something in a text or in social media and they don't know you're doing it, what are you going to do with that? You don't have to. You're their parents, their educators, their clinicians, their practitioners, their friends, their allies. Watch them when they're in absent presence, when they're on their device. Watch their affect. Watch their expressions. If their fingers start flying and watch how they are after. Not be one day, but if it's chronic. If you start seeing something that is the device is causing them corporally or somatically or affect or check it out. Find out what's going on. You don't need to find out what it is. Find out gently. And that's what I tell parents. Parents need to be in charge of this. They need to be guardrails because these companies are not going to do it. They're saying they're going to legislation. We'll see. We'll see. I'm going to Washington in three weeks. So trust me, they don't want to see me. I'm going to be banned from Washington. Somebody's speaking to some of these people. They're making a big mistake letting me come there. You might see it on the news. Maybe it'll trend on Twitter. I'm just saying pay attention to your kids and yourself. Model the behavior. Some of us are just as bad. And put down your phone with your kids. Thank you very much. Not too loud. Angela Carrillo. Angela Carrillo is the owner and CEO of Brass Tax Recovery. Prior to working in the mental health field, her professional background was diverse and comprised of various opportunities, including positions as a paralegal for a maritime law firm, maritime law firm, vice president of operations for an executive security company, and director of a national sales force for a healthcare company. I also want to tell you, she's a U.S. veteran. Thank you for your service. Yeah. All right. So she's a certified intervention professional, practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, certified professional coach, and certified pivot relational coach. She brings attachment and trauma-informed solutions to clients and families. She has served on the board of directors for the Women's for Watt Women's Association for Addiction Treatment, held several board positions within various chapters of the LA International Association of Eating Disorders. She's also on the one board. Uh, she has a BA in psychology, minor addiction studies. Now, that's her, and now this is what she does and what she did with that. Just one of the things she does. Brass Tax Recovery is a combination of Angela's personal and professional experience. She developed the Coach to Intervene CTI, trademark, superscript, family, family system. Well, they can't read it. i got to tell them. Uh, intervention technique. She'll talk about that, I hope. It is within this model that families are given the missing pieces to carve a new way of educating themselves while supporting the, those they love. And I want you to talk about that, Ange. Ange considers it her privilege, honor to be entrusted with a family's loved one and strongly believes her success began when her personal brokenness became her professional usefulness. All right. She feels passionate about her healing, the individual healing process. She's currently writing a book, and uh, I'm going to let her talk about the rest of the stuff she does. But that's Angela. Let's move on. Duck, duck, John Lieberman. Okay, John Lieberman. John is a nationally recognized expert in adolescent treatment, intervention, and family dynamics. He has traveled internationally evaluating adolescent treatment centers and presented at numerous addiction and mental health industry conferences. And as far as I know, you're not banned from any countries, right? You're welcome? Cool. That's a big thing. For over 37 years, John has guided families through their most turbulent times. 37 years. He started when he was two. So he is currently the COO for Visions Adolescent Treatment Centers. He holds a master's in industrial and organizational psychology. It's always super interesting to me when I hear what people did in their life before. Again, I'm imagining, John, and maybe I'm wrong, that degree in industrial and organizational psychology really helps with the kids. I'm sure those skill sets apply, correct? Yeah, I figured that's cool. 
So, widely regarded as a pioneer in the field, Visions continues to provide innovative and evidence-based treatments since first opening its doors, that is true. Mr. Lieberman joined Visions in 2002 when he was one, creating the initial building blocks to ensure Visions became the permanent provider of adolescent treatment for substance abuse and mental health. John began his career in 1985. He's held every position, virtually every, which is amazing. Didn't just start at the top, he worked his way up. Uh, in addiction treatment. He's been a program aide, floor supervisor, youth counselor, crisis counselor, intervention specialist, director of outreach for two high-profile treatment facilities, and also worked at Starbucks. No? No. Okay. Got it through. Hasn't everybody? Charismatic and, charismatic and tenacious, Mr. Lieberman remains down-to-earth and accessible. He is personalizing. He's a father. He's a husband. And he's a grandfather. I know. He started when he was zero. He and his wife, Cindy, live in Camarillo, California, with their two overindulged wiener dogs. At least you're honest. <clears throat> Next. Ryan Blyvis. <clears throat> I recognize him. Ryan Blyvis, and you should, because he's also been around a long time. Ryan Blyvis is a behavioral health care entrepreneur and teen mental health advocate who is passionate about finding solutions to combat the mental health crisis in America. In 2015, Ryan co-founded the Key Collective, a clinical mentoring, parent coaching, and companioning program for teens and young adults. Today, the Key Collective has expanded to provide mentoring services throughout Southern California and has helped over a 1,000 families. I think it's more. You've helped some families that I've given to you to help. And you also just opened a, a residential program in Malibu which might as tough on that. He'll tell you about the progression, maybe. In addition, to, in addition to the work with Key Collective, he's also the CMO and founder of Key Healthcare, which includes the Residential Treatment Center in Malibu that they just expanded to, again, Mazel Tov, Teen Outpatient and Partial Hospitalization Clinic in West LA, and Teen Transitional Living Program. Throughout these programs, Ryan's dedicated to providing the highest level of care to teens and families struggling with mental health and substance use disorder. Now, let's humanize him. When he's not working, Ryan enjoys racing in Ironman and ultra marathon competitions, which just every time I see him, I go into a shame spiral. I am so lazy. And the good on you. Good for you. Do those for me. And spending time with his wife and wait for it, three daughters. I have two and we stopped and we're going to end up with seven brides for seven brothers. Ryan is three. No wonder he has to do these Ironman trainings. This is our panel, and we've already introduced Dr. Gabay. I mean, really? Come on. This is free. Lynn is giving you these people for free. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We've had many questions that have been submitted. So each of the panel are going to uh, answer questions. Before we do that, I'm going to give them each a little bit of time, and I hope that's okay with you. Bob and I got to do our thing, but it's really important. These people generously gave their time and braved either the 405 or the 101 to get here. So they deserve this. So I'm going to start with you, Angela, and I want you to talk in a little bit for a few minutes about what you do, talk about city, whatever you feel, these people and our friends out there in the Digiverse on live stream, hello, whatever they'd like to know. Can you do that for us? Yeah. Right on. Angela Carrillo, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Grant, and thank you, Dr. Gabay, as well. And it's an honor to sit with all of you. Thank you, One Recovery, for continuing to bring awareness to the community, and a big thanks to the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health for really putting your money where where the awareness is and for giving this grant. It it's a privilege as well to be on the board of of One on campus and One Recovery and. Please check out the website, everyone. So what I want to discuss for a few minutes is um, a model that, I, that Brass Tax Recovery that I designed. And the reason I want to talk about it is not to promote the model for me, but I want families to understand it in a sense. And as an interventionist, what was happening, the, the CTI, the Coach to Intervene model, actually was a response to a need that I saw where families were unable to go through an intervention process because they were scared. And I think I was actually thinking when you were talking, Don, that 
some of it is this, this crazy curve right now with social media and availability of substances online. And I think parents are just trying to keep up as well. And what we're seeing, a lot of us is adolescents and young adults are, are having challenges with substance use and mental health at a rapid pace that even all of us as professionals and even facilities are trying to keep up with on some level. And this, this, this model was designed for the family that doesn't do anything because they're scared. The word intervention, I think, in and of itself is a pretty frightening word. It, in, in a sense, what intervention is, is really just interrupting something. It's disrupting something that's negative, is, is what an intervention is trying to do. And with a coach to intervene, I understood that families were stuck because they weren't ready to confront the person they loved because they were have they would have feelings, what if my kid doesn't talk to me anymore? What if they're mad at me? What if they leave? What if they go live on the streets? What if they just take off? What am I going to do? What if they live in their car? So parents, primarily parents were so terrified to do anything that they would call and talk about an intervention and then they would kind of fade away. And what I realized is that they needed more support that there is a time in an intervention process for a family. I don't even like to call them interventions. I call them family meetings. There was a time that was necessary for a family to understand why are we doing this? But more importantly, what's going to happen to my kid if we do this this way or this way or that way? There, there is a time as an interventionist, I'm always looking for the time. There's a time to confront, and then there's a time to challenge, and then there's a time to really invite a family into a new conversation, right? Parents are protecting their children. And an intervention almost feels like you're not protecting your children. It, it, it feels like, well, we know we need to do something, but aren't we being mean to them? Or aren't we kind of really setting a bottom line that's too much? So what I and, and what Brass Tech started doing was really coaching these families to understand that an intervention doesn't always, sometimes it does. There are times when a CTI model is not my choice. There are times when the level of acuity of mental health or substance abuse is so high that we do need to do more of what's referred to as a Johnson model intervention, more of a confrontational intervention with harder boundaries. There's a time for that because life or death is the most important thing. Safety of your child is the most important thing to all of us. So what I wanted to do was create something that allowed a family the time and process to understand within themselves, how do I parent from my values and beliefs? How do I make different choices so that I can offer my child help and support without scaring them away from me? Because from, from my experience, one of the greatest fears any parent has is that their kid isn't going to want to have a relationship with them. In fact, a lot of parents are terrified through adolescence because, you know, your kid basically stops kind of talking to you. You're not the cool thing anymore, right? So to actually offer them help is a process. And it doesn't always have to be an ultimatum. We may need to get to an ultimatum. We may need to have conversations with them. Yet primarily what I wanted to invest in is the parent. I want parents to understand that an intervention does not have to be a frightening thing. That to offer your child help and support needs to be a conversation. It needs to come from your heart and it needs to come from reality. We can't always be best friends with our kids, right? That's not the point. The point is when your child is in danger or the beginning of danger, and I'll, I'll finish with this. When something, I love how Dr. Grant talked about it and Dr. Gabay touched on it. When there is something going on with your kid or your family member or your husband or your wife and suddenly the dots aren't matching, it's important to pay attention to that. And that's when we want to begin the conversation of what would getting help look like? And, and in this kind of intervention, it can be longer term. It can be a week. It can be four, five, six months. But the most important thing for all of us, and especially for me, is that that family is left after working with us with more coping skills, more information and education, more ways to support their loved one than when they got to us. So thank you. Thank you. That's really great, Angela. And I want to ask while we're here, and we'll go down the panel and do, uh, you know, repeat. Step and repeat, except we're sitting. Sit and repeat. Uh, 
you've been given uh, we've been given questions from uh, that were submitted. Uh, do you have a question, or because I actually have one for you that was submitted? Okay, so one of the questions was, and I heard you answer this, and oh my god, it was so brilliant. Everyone on this panel is so brilliant. You talked about families. You talked about the kids. How does a family or parents know when it's time to ask for help or even intervention? How do they know when that when it's the right time? Because we give a lot of chances, and the kids say, oh, my friend. How do you know? I think as a parent, it's a natural thing to believe in your child. You're your greatest you're your child's greatest cheerleader. So what's what's important as your child's greatest cheerleader is the time to begin to ask for help is as soon as you begin to think it's time to ask for help. Not after. Not after in the moment when you feel that in the core of your being as a parent, when you know that something needs to be done. That's the time to ask for help. It doesn't mean that we have to do anything extreme in that moment. Sometimes we do. But right when you feel that you may need help is the time to begin to ask for help. That's fantastic, Ange. Thanks. And I just had a family say today, you know, we don't know when it's time to pull the trigger. And I'm like, well, there's lots of people who will help. And a lot of them are on this panel. Thanks, Ange. Okay. So John Lieberman. Oh, you have it. Sorry, you have a mic. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about something I missed that you feel you that they would like to know and our friends at home? And then, uh, did you get you have a question that was provided with you that you want to answer as well? Yes. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Ladies Don. John Lieberman. You, I'm supposed to talk about something you missed. Well. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I went through your bio, but if there's something on there that you feel passionate about, I want to make sure I'm respectful. So, you know, but I would really love to hear about those overindulged dogs. Do you want to do a few confession now? Do, yeah, I could go through yeah, the, the wonder wonder dog, dog syndrome. Let, yeah. um, they'll do anything you want them to do as long as it's their idea. Um, kind of like adolescence, I, I think, do. you know. So um, I, it is so important to talk about social media, intervention, treatment. Um, and and the, the way the brain works and one of the things I appreciated that you brought up um, was uh, the idea of loneliness and um, when we think about um, um, social media a lot of it is kind of group rage you know like people getting together and all but that is not something that that creates connection that Don was talking about in many ways if we think about support groups um, that are out there, whatever kind of support groups they are, some, a lot of times it's 12-step or other programs, it's holding hands with strangers, whether we're helping somebody through, say, substance abuse, addiction, trauma. There's so many groups out there when somebody has lost loved ones or for um, trauma survivors, um, when individuals have diseases, there's specific groups when somebody has cancer um, or lost somebody during COVID. There's specific support groups, and people just get together because they've been in like situations and circumstances and find connection that way. And that's one of the things that happens a lot of times in interventions when families come together, um, in treatment centers. A lot of times um, somebody thinks sending somebody to a treatment center is an extreme act. Let me tell you something. An extreme act is going to the hospital when your child has had a suicide attempt or you find out they've been cutting or they're getting um, expelled from school or they tell you that they can't go to school anymore they can't wake up anymore those are the extreme things really what treatment is is uh, about getting help and it's important that we talk about this this way even though it feels like um, it can create such anxiety and all of these emotions because a lot of times we're dealing something that we are also as parents dealing with as well and it's crossing lines that can be difficult, but that can be helpful. It's kind of like, um, you know, like when you got to take the bandage off of a wound, but that's the only way it's going to heal. Or when a doctor has to do surgery to help something get better. We understand these things in medical terms, but in mental health terms, we get afraid of it a lot of times and shrink back. But that's one of the ways people get help is by people coming together to support them through a process. And, um, you know, when Lynn talked about um, one, one on campus and one recovery, one of the things that uh, a long time ago, Claudia Black 
talked about what happens in families when there's trauma, when there's addiction. Um, and she said they families learn to don't talk, don't trust, um, don't feel. <clears throat> Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Those are kind of the lessons. Those are the rules that families learn because it's painful. What one does when bring, by bringing people together, what Angela does by bringing families together, what, we, what happens at key mentoring when just two people are together hanging out is they learn to talk. They learn to trust and they learn to feel. And they learn to do it. And what we try to do is do that in a safe way. and and uh, and. That, I think, also rolls into, well, then how do we, we're here, say, on the internet, we're thinking about take action, and what can we do? And, you know, I got to say, we kind of suck at this. I'm just, we, we, we do. We don't have a clear message throughout the schools for kids, for families. What do I hang on to? And one of the things we know is we've got to educate kids and families, right? Early on, it's almost like we can. We got to say, let's start in kindergarten. From kindergarten to college, we need to educate them. We need to create prevention programs, so to speak, through education, and then comes in intervention, just different kinds of ways to intervene. And then it could be intervention and then treatment. What are those treatment services that we're going to provide? And then the continuing care for them. But that's from kindergarten to college. There's a way to do these things. It's actually not that complicated. But it does take grants like Take Action, what LA County is doing, and consistency so that we can help kids. And absolutely, kids get better. I've been dealing with kids, 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 and wiener dogs. But, but, but um, I believe that they can get better. I believe that kids can get sober who've had substance abuse issues young. I got sober at 17 years old. I skipped eighth grade, graduated at 16 years old, and had a terrible methamphetamine problem. There's a gentleman in the back with, um, uh, with mission uh, prep. Uh, Corey got sober at 17 years old. Now, he's a lot younger than I am. But people like that, who we, kids can get better. And I think a lot of times in our day and age, and I'm going to end with this, we have been talking about mental health, mental health, mental health, mental health. A lot of kids are treating men mental health with things like social media, um, with substances. And we have been seeing substance abuse consequences and deaths rise and rise and rise. We've been seeing suicide rise and rise and rise. And for every suicide and every substance abuse death, there's like seven or eight other catastrophic events for other people that didn't end up at that level that affects the families. And we can make a difference by connecting. Thanks, John. That's brilliant. And what John was saying is absolutely true and i'm guessing that you are here because you have created a community even for one night of like-minded others which is what lynn does which is what we talk about and now i'm going to uh turn it over to ryan blavis and i'm going to tell you ryan please feel free to obviously talk about what you want to but we got a bunch of questions and i know one of the things that you do and your company and key mentoring does and you personally have done since i've known you a long time is help kids who are struggling when they're in treatment or when they're trying to go through treatment reconnect how do i reconnect with teens and and i'm straight edge now but you guys do this so well so if you could talk about that at some point because those are some of the questions because kids say the parents say i can't my kid doesn't want to go to treatment because what does he do afterwards thank you i'm going to stand up um thank you lynn one recovery dawn everyone here so grateful to be here so what do we do with this information, right? Social media is, is harming in our, these future generations. Suicide rates are up 500% in the last decade. Depression is up, you know, close to 300%. What does this mean, right? What does this mean we have cell phone and TikTok and Instagram? The reality is, is it's not going to go anywhere. We have to understand this is a part of our culture. It's going to, with AI, chat, GPT, just wait, right, of what continues to happen. So we need to kind of understand the landscape of what our teens are, are going up against culturally. And we also need to normalize words like anxiety, right, peer pressure, low self-esteem, depression, fear, feeling left out. These are all feelings that 
even the captain of the, you know, the, the, the quarterback of the football team feels, right? No one is, can stay away from these mental health problems and struggles. That is just a part of our culture. Teams today are more lost than ever, and they're empty, right? That's why we have one recovery. That's why we look toward finding connection, right? We, in our programs throughout the eight years, the number one question I ask parents is, what is your kid passionate about? And usually the answer is, I don't know. They, they lost it. I have no idea. We need to start to really connect with our kids. We need to intimately understand and level with them, right? Shame. We're shaming teens for doing bad in school, for getting in trouble at home. That is the wrong approach. We need to help them. We need to connect with them. We need to level with them. And we need to provide them with connection. You know, it's we have a transitional living program that teens go to after they go to treatment and they can earn their cell phones back. And the number one thing parents say to me is, oh, what about when they get their cell phone back? Are they going to use it all the time? And what's going to happen? This is what's happened because these kids are rock climbing. They're in our music studio. They're in school. They're working out. They have purpose. They have connection. Do you think that they're on their phone, on social media, going on the internet? They're not that we're not focused on the phone we're focused on who we are as people who are teens what is their purpose and how are we building them up right we need to start to be on the same level as teens and also we need to be parents we got to stay on top of them but we have to come from a place of compassion and understanding because we don't even understand right and that's okay we're all learning through this experience and Luckily, there's incredible programs. There's incredible people. Just this right here at school, being able to do this is a major, major, you know, success for LA County, you know, and for Calabasas. I, I'm from LA. I went to treatment as a teen. I was a, you know, there's four kids. I was like a tennis player. It was all good. And then I was, you know, drinking my parents' alcohol and smoking pot and, you know, depressed and anxious and stopped going to school. No one was checking in with me. Hey, Ryan, what's going on? It seems like something's wrong. I was looked at like I was a behavioral kid and like we need to get away from that, right? We need to normalize this stuff. We have to come together as a community. We need to all work together to help this future generation that's lost. And we have all these expectations for them to be, to understand how to use their cell phones and not be on TikTok all the time. I mean, all of us probably have those apps and are using them in an unhealthy way also. And we're trying to tell teens this. So it's all, what can we do with this information? Here's the good news, right? I speak at a lot of schools. Lynn knows this, John. You talk to teens. They're actually way more aware of this stuff than we think they are, right? They know these things. They don't want to have to be on their phones. They don't want to have to be seeking the dopamine rush from Instagram or TikTok. But we're not giving them outlets and opportunities and new experiences to find out who they are. Every single kid has one thing that they can connect with and believe in and gives them purpose. It's our job as parents, as counselors, as treatment professionals to find that one thing that lights them up, that makes them feel fulfilled and provides them with connection. And that's kind of really what it's about. This is a conversation. And we can all talk to each other. Let's make this a real thing and continue on and, and all help each other in this because we're all going through it together no matter I'm 35, you know, I see my five and four-year-old, you know, it's all 17, 16. We're all trying to do our best here. So uh, grateful to be here. Grateful that everyone who showed up, everyone who's on the live stream, this is the first step in taking action. Thanks. And I want to point out, Ryan has small children. Dr. Gabay, I believe your child also is on this campus. Yes, I Okay, so yours is currently a coyote. Mine's a coyote alumni. Go coyote, sorry, Agora. Not sorry. Uh, John has grandchildren. You have children. What Ryan said, I hope you heard it, because one of the things I also tell parents, don't they're against us and we're going to lose. If we are 12 steps behind these kids on any given day, we are hashtag rushing it. Band together with other parents of your kids' friends. Say, so they're not the only one who can have these apps. 
get together and say, we're going to do this together as a group. That was great, Ryan. Okay, Dr. Gabay, I, we got a lot of questions, and I'm putting on the spot, but you are the MD. So I also want to ask if you can talk for us for a couple of minutes before and we'll open it up maybe to a couple of questions. One of the, uh, the major theme is, okay, and I'm going to let you do what you want with this, cannabis and vaping. Because this is a thing, and how and it's bad, and now it's legal. So can you just give a little bit or something, whatever you want to say, take action, cannabis vaping. Okay, so I'm going to start it off by, let's just take cannabis vaping in general. Um, I think what I want to hit home is, let's find out why they're using. So the individual kid. So rather than saying, is it good, is it bad, what does the literature say, what is it medical, what does the cannabis and vaping do for you? It's that simple. Oh, well, it helps. So let's, so let's take that. So when I see kids in treatment, I don't say, you know, tell me all the bad things. I say, I assume that it does something positive for them because um, a very smart individual once told me, any behavior that you do two or more times it's being rewarded. It has a purpose. And again, a lot of people, they use cannabis the first time, vape the first time, nothing, no effect. But then the second time, third time, it starts helping them. It's the minority of people, I use it just for the sake of getting high. For some people, it really helps them sleep. For some people, it really allows them to distract from the crap in their life, and you can fill in the blank. For others, it does help with depression, anxiety, short term. You have to honor that. You have to acknowledge that. And then that starts a conversation on, so what could it possibly be doing negatively? Well, doctor, I've noticed that over time, I'm using it more. I'm using it at multiple times a day. I'm starting not to study as well. I'm starting to miss school. Okay, it's causing problems. So again, so that's sort of where I go from the individual perspective. You know, from the MD medical doctor, you know, you, you have all, again, I think a lot of this was brought on by advocates, but a lot of these indications for medical reasons, it just doesn't pan out. We've done research, and again, cannabis is still illegal by the federal government, so it's hard to do hardcore research, but really as far as long-term depression, anxiety, it doesn't help long-term, and in many ways makes things worse. Um, unfortunately, the you know, there are some benefits to cannabis, specifically the non-psychoactive part, or what is known as cannabinoid, as opposed to the THC or the addictive part that gives you a high. But you don't see dispensaries advertising or selling the medicinal aspect of it like crazy. Because, again, it's the cannabis has been marketed and bred and crossbred to be more and more potent over the past 10, 20 years. So, um, like Lynn was saying, for these young individuals and what kind of environment are we live giving them, whatever we as parents might have used in the past, it's a lot less potent than the stuff out there now. It's a lot less potent edibly than that stuff that's not in there now. And it is creating dependence, depression, um, and in some cases, psychosis. Um, you know, there is a lot of research that shows for individuals who are prone to have psychotic disorders. I'm going to stand too, Ryan. Um, psychosis meaning being just being lost of touch with reality. Again, that is increased more by cannabis use in teenagers than other drugs or alcohol or even meth that you think, oh my, meth, I'm going to go crazy. So again, for individuals who are Teenagers especially who might have a family history, these substances can make things worse. Um, regarding the vaping, again, we, you, anytime you take a substance that you combust or you burn, it's going to have chemicals. It's not healthy for your heart or your lungs, and you just don't know what kind of garbage is in there. And same with the cannabis. It's not like it's tested in a lab and purified and it's standard. So buyer beware. But again, I think a lot of research has shown that especially for teenagers whose brains are still developing, the cannabis can affect their development. Um, so again, yeah, if, if you're gonna, it's a lot. App, so again, it's I think it's all about harm reduction, and but it's all about what kind of purpose does it serve? So like Ryan said, what kind of purpose? 
does the drug serve and can we substitute it for something else? Because again, it is serving a purpose. It is helping with some unmet need. But what can we do to substitute in a more healthy way? Thank you. And that's right. And obviously, the bottom line, because kids say this all the time, I say, uh, both are illegal for you. So I'll have parents say, I'll have kids say to me, you know, well, you know, about devices and social media. My parents complain about my devices, but they're on them more than I am. Well, check yourselves, parents. And with the weed, now that it's legal, my parents smoke weed. Well, talk to them about that. Thank you. All right, so here's what I want to do is rounding the, the time. I want to open it up to your questions because we got a bunch of questions and you put my panel, the panel, and obviously you've now seen they are multidisciplinary experts. So are there any questions you have? Do me a favor. Anyone who has a question, get surprised. Thank you very much. Thank you for being of service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey, everybody. And uh, going through some experiences with one of my teens right now with cannabis use. And I guess my question stems from in trying different methods to connect with my kids. Uh, I try to share a common experience. I try to be real and realistic. Uh, these things exist. They existed in the 80s when I grew up in the valley and I was going to Zuma Beach and smoking a joint and jumping on my surfboard. Um, but now that sharing of commonality has become weaponized by one of my kids because now all of a sudden I'm not an authority to speak about these issues with her. And I'm a hypocrite. Um, and my wife's like, I think you might have given too much away too soon. So how do you... Is there any suggestions on how you talk to your kids when you have done the things that you're trying to prevent them from doing themselves? You are. Uh, you have the right panel because everybody on this panel can answer that. And I don't know if you have thoughts, but you want to take this, John, and then if you put a few people, Angela or Ryan, go ahead. You, you got the right panel for that question. What was your name again? John. John, we'll do this together. Is it on? Can you hear me? All right. Um, you know, first of all, just being open and vulnerable in front of other people, that's a big effing deal for all of us because it we're not good at talking about what goes on behind the closed doors of our home. Um, and I know that the reason you're talking about it is because you care and you're worried. You know, and it is also, we all question ourselves with these things. Right? Like, um, did I tell them too much, too soon, too late? Um, and kids, but if you didn't say anything, then they'll weaponize that. Because, you know, it, that's part of being a teenager. That's part of the maturation process. But here's what we know is, you know, we think about how we engage with our kids when they're first born. Right? And that's probably a lot of what we think about when your daughter's telling you what an idiot you are. Right? Um, and sometimes you're going, yeah, she's kind of right in that area. But what it, when we think about attachment, one of the things that adolescents, one of the things that adolescents start doing is as they're doing things that are kind of against what your kind of your household, what I call kind of your, your moral expectations, they separate themselves. When they separate themselves, then they kind of get that more instability, and it's harder to connect, and it's harder to connect, and you're trying to figure it out. So what I would say is this, never stop stopping. You just keep it up. Um, usually you can wear them out. The other thing is um, get some help. Like talk, like get some outside help from, say, somebody who is a specialist dealing with families, adolescents, that conversation, and it may irritate the hell out of her. But I figure it's fair. She's irritating the hell out of you. But it's kind of like, I'm just not going to stop stopping. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep figuring out. Are you ever going to give up on your kids? So I think that's the biggest piece is find some help. Find somebody to talk to who's a professional. Because as you work on those communication skills, she won't be able to help but feel. And you will always find out more information. And I think, like you said, it's finding that piece in there. like that piece to connect with her, but 
sometimes substances can cover over that, but you can always uncover that. And there is a difference. I do want to honor this. There's a difference between kids and using vapes and being able to get high three or four. You basically hit that a little bit, a little bit all day long. That is different than what we saw when you went out and smoked a joint and went surfing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, th there are some differences. So your concerns, I want to say, are are real. Yeah, the potency is what really freaks me out. Mm -hmm. It's like chemically manufactured in a lab. It's like 50% THC. It's well, frightening. So what I say is this, is there's a difference between a beer and a bottle of Picardi 151. They may both be alcohol, but the consequences of those things are completely different. We got sold a bill of goods on the whole pot thing. We didn't know it was planned. Somebody else did. But So that's why it's okay to kind of be come from that point of view and say, hey, look, this is different, and I'm here to help and support you. And the other thing is when I talk, when I think about this, I think whether you were smoking a joint or whatever, there was still a risk involved there, you know. Um, so it's kind of like driving a car at 100 miles an hour. Every kid wants to do it. No parent is okay with it. And I think that's okay not to be okay with it and figure out a way to solve that. That's great, John. And I appreciate that. And did he get a prize? Yeah. Um, I, tell my, I tell my kids and the teens I work with, yeah, we didn't know. When I was growing up, my parents put me on their lap while they were driving, drinking, and now we have seatbelts. Why? So we learn. So just because we thought it was okay, and that's what my parents thought was okay. Yeah, when I think about that, it's insane we survived that with sliding around those seats. All right. Who else has a question? Oh, right there. Hi. Wait for the mic. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Um, my question was, is there any data that shows the best age to introduce social media and or social, um, you know, to a child and or electronics? Because I've seen it go from everywhere from six months as the babysitter up to where they want to make, wait till they're 10 years old before they allow them to have any except for limiting them to like, you know, 911 or to to let them know the parents are home. Is there anything to kind of back I'm going to do this question? quick because it's a whole thing. I'm just going to make it that there's this whole thing about ages, and I'm talking about this a lot lately. Uh, 13, I don't know. Uh, we could talk about the 13-year-olds we've all treated, and they're all very different. Um, I don't think that there's an age, and uh, the, the, the platforms, most of them, it says you have to be 13, but they're all going on it at 8. You are the parents. You are paying for these devices. You are paying for the platforms. These kids are overexposed and underdeveloped. I don't think that they need to be on it. And I think that you know your kid and when they're going to be ready. And you need to let them know that and have conversations early about digital literacy and all these things that were in the APA uh, guidelines. But it's turn, in terms of them having social media, I just want to point this out, which you may not know. And every time I say this, people go, oh, really? Let's talk about TikTok, which is the cause celeb right now. Uh, Bike Dance, which is behind TikTok. The TikTok that kids see under 14 in China is very different than the one in America. In America, they can have the same one as adults. The company that invented it in China has a very different. Kids under 14 cannot access it. The thing they can access on TikTok is baking shows, scientific experiments, nationalistic things, but they don't get that. So why do we have it? So I'm just going to leave it there and I'm going to end with this. And this is the metaphor. It's your kids. You get to decide. Your kids say to you, I want a motorcycle at four years old. Are you going to give it to them? No. What you're going to do is you're going to give them a tricycle. Then you're going to give them when they're ready, a bike that has training wheels and those cool little sparkly things that come off of the handles. It may be a, bike, a basket and a belt. You're going to give them that and the training wheels don't come off. Then you're going to get them a bike where the training wheels come off. You're not going to take them off. You're going to trust them, make sure they can handle it, teach them how to stop at the end of the street, stranger danger, what to do, how to walk in it, and please bring it in the house so it doesn't get stolen. And then you're going to teach them about that. And then you're going to take off the training wheels and pray as you watch them Go down that side. Oh, my God. I remember this. Going down that side. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then watching as they get it. And then maybe they're going to tell you they want an e-bike. That's up to you. I'm just saying we do the same thing. Why just hand them social media? Brian, did you want to make a comment? Yeah. Um, I just want to say, too, right? This is like kind of the new counterculture we need to start. Is this? It is normalized. And I... I, you know, have 
talk to parents is is oh 13 years old they everyone has a phone all my friends have an iphone oh everyone's smoking pot oh it's okay it doesn't mean that for your family or our families that we have to follow that trend because we see where it's trending it's trending into hospitals trending into our program so my point is it's okay for teens to be uncomfortable and for us to tell them things they don't want to hear and to kind of hold the line because as parents we do have the power even though it doesn't feel like that all the time so again it's uncomfortable to tell teens or kids things that they don't want to hear or is against the culture of high schools but that's okay if we can sit in the discomfort and be okay with our kids being uncomfortable and we say hey we're going to bring in a treatment professional hey we're going to introduce someone because in our family this is not how we do things as a value system in our family and that's okay um, i'm sorry just one thing to add uh i have a feeling what we've said is in so many ways also as a parent easier said than done um i think a lot of this especially with with just the phone is this is how teens communicate if your son or daughter is in and i'm not even talking high school let's just say fifth grade, sixth grade, if they're the one kid without the phone, with who can't communicate, you know, there's been many parents that are going to be left out of things. That's the way the kids communicate. Um, and I think it really behooves us with this program tonight to really work in partnerships with the school on having a school agreement on what technology is going to be like, what self in usage is going to be like. How are there ways through the school maybe that doesn't require a phone? For kids to communicate and again this is very comfortable the school might want not want to get involved but i think if there's enough parents that have a critical mass like don said and work as a community um which again in some schools that's easier than others that might be ultimately the way to go so not one or two parents are ostracized for being oh the parent that doesn't allow their fifth grader or sixth grader with a phone but it's i i empathize it's it's very hard um and again it's your we're really up against a lot. And I say that as a parent myself. I think I also want to say as someone working with young adults that I'm often on the other side between ages, you know, 19 and upwards to 30 of those parenting risk moments, right? Those moments where as a parent, you're going to say no. And what I'm noticing, and a lot of us, I'm sure, is these, the young adults have less resilience and less coping skills so I encourage parents to say no. I encourage parents to come together, as everyone has said, to be able to say no and allow your child to feel discomfort and learn how to emotionally respond to discomfort. Because I'm seeing a lot of young adults not launching from home, not being able to handle certain things because they weren't able to build those resiliency skills at a younger age. So thanks. Do we have any other questions? Thanks, Ange. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Anyone? Sure. Um, I watched an interesting video and the guy was talking about with your kids kind of thinking of trust as a, like a bank account. And uh, when your kid is doing activities or behaviors that are tearing down trust, it's like they got caught doing drugs. It zeroes out that account. Um, and then they need to build it up. And I, w I wonder what your opinion is on drug testing for your kids when they have shown that they use. Uh, Anybody can, I think, again, any of you want to jump in and give a couple, give two minutes on this? I guess so we can move. Uh, We're probably going to say about the same thing, but um, when um, our medical director, Dr. Lewis, started, he was, the, med he was uh, the medical director for substance abuse and mental health for the NBA, and they started drug testing. And what the guy said was, this was a fail-safe for them. They could say, I can't do that without losing face because they said, I'm going to get drug tested. So that can be a safety net where it's not about them being a square. If they are caught in a situation, my parents are going to drug test me. It's not the answer to everything, but... It is, a, it is a way, especially when you already know there's an issue for accountability, we absolutely all use that in treatment as a component um, of, of, uh, for, for accountability. But I would say this, when 
um, if you had a child who had diabetes and you saw their their levels and you said, well, that's just a horrible level. I can't believe you did that. Did you eat all that sugar? In fact, you're out of the house now. We would not do that. We would say, oh, what's going on here? There's a problem. Let's get a professional involved here or let's look at what's been going on in the house and your exercise routine. And I think if we take that stand when it comes to um, drug tests, we do a much better job and are much more respectful. That's great. Okay, before we turn over to Lynn, last chance, burning desire. If someone has a question that you think this panel can answer in one minute or less. <laughs> Right here in the front, you just want it. You just want a prize. It's all good. I don't care. Thanks for being here. You guys are all very good people for doing this. So, a little off the subject, but not really. This is my daughter Evie, and Hi. she wants to be you guys one day. You know, oh, you want to be us and not one of our clients? Right on. I'm just uh, saying. Uh, what? I kept it real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, now we don't need to get yeah, there you go. Hey, Lynn, to her. Yeah. Well, my question is, what would you recommend for someone? She's a junior. She wants to pursue this as a career. And uh, she'll be going to college for this next year. I think this is it's a Lynn question, actually. I actually think it's almost even a Lisa question. Um, you know, going through, it's it's finding what you're passionate about. I won't front you off and make you do it. But, so you know. Huh? You want to? You start. Okay. All right. um, I'd say in this field specifically, because I have no clue what I want to do. Maybe I'll end up here. Maybe I won't. I'm just doing business right now in school. But just finding somewhere, like with one, I don't want to be like, oh my God, one major advertise, because obviously. But the thing with one is like, it started off not, being like, I want to work with you guys. I want the job because it was in senior year for me. It was, I really like drawing on my iPad and can I do some of that for you? And they let me start doing their flyers and that snowballed into what I'm doing now. But just finding somewhere that will just cater to what you want to do. And that can be anything. Like if it was fashion, it can be something with a company, with a fashion brand. If it's this, you know, we can talk to the people here, just asking too. Like, you'll never get the opportunity unless you just always ask for it. And I think knowing is remarkable that you sat in the front row, says you're showing up for yourself. Like, I'm so impressed. You're everything that we want to encourage kids to be, that to find that thing. And luckily, you know, you've got your parent here that's sitting in the front row with you. Like, it just, it's everything what you're doing and what it is is showing up listening to experts acknowledging that these are experts putting it out there like what can i do you're a junior we could talk to you about volunteering with one and getting involved or maybe popping up a one on campus here and going you can intern you can show up for things and being an intern isn't always that much fun i mean it may be unloading my car mm -hmm. um because i don't want to carry stuff um but it can start with anything but the fact that you know what you want is remarkable. And um, and you just step in. And here's the thing that we tell the kids in one all the time. You can have anything you want in this life. And I mean that. If you are willing to work for it. And it's not easy. And it may be harder for you than some people. I mean, it may not be. But it's like, okay, so what? Now what? There's my goal. I'm going to get to it. And sometimes on that way to that thing we think we want, something else comes in that's ours, right? And it fits. But you are already so far ahead. And by showing up tonight, get their phone numbers. Like these are important people. You know, we're doing other panels um, in El Segundo on accidental overdose. Dr. Timothy Fong from UCLA is one of the lead cannabis experts. He spoke for us at Santa Monica. He's always saying, and he's on the board of one, let people contact me. You know, there are people that want to share their passion with you. So I just want to tell you, you know, ending with you, like, that's everything, you know. So let's give her a round of applause. These prizes, I'm sorry. Like, I did not know he was going to do this prize thing again. Yes, everybody wants an emoji squishy. Like, okay. Um, well, I just want to say, um, I can't believe I'm losing my voice so sad for the world. But um, I just want to say to everybody who came out tonight, thank you. 
Thank you for being a part of the conversation. Thank you for coming out for something so positive. And I just also want to say to you, sometimes if you're standing, like you came here by yourself, like your friends, I'm sure you guys do stuff together, but they didn't come, but you did. And sometimes when we're standing alone, we're in really good company. Like when you're on the path to get to where you want to be. And that says a lot about you. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that adolescence is a time to make mistakes, but it's also a time to rise. It's an exciting time. And that as parents, even though we're in fear, if we can stand in and stand by our kids and, um, and ask for help when we need it and ask for help when we don't know. And uh, these people are here, those resources out there are here for you to be able to do that. Those of you on live stream, we'll have it in the comments. We'll have it in the body so you know who you can reach out to. But I do want to, again, thank the Department of Mental Health for creating this funding so we could come out and do this. Um, I want to thank everybody that gives up their time to one. And the one thing I do want to tell you is that at the end of June, I've worked in adolescent mental health for 38 years and no, actually 39. Now that it's really big numbers, I just now I want to push it down. Okay. So um, but 39 years and from helping build treatment centers to then creating this nonprofit where there be space for connection. And for five years, I worked on something called ATC retreats, which is alter the course retreats. And it's everything we were talking about. It's a seven day retreat for kids. It's not therapy, but it'll be highly therapeutic. It's not a treatment center. It's a space for a pause for seven days. It's got low academic impact and it's where the kids learn to tell the story of who they are. Right. And know that they may not think they have one, but we all have one. And it's about creating connection, finding their passion. And um, so there'll be more about that, but it's AT, atcretreats.com. Check it out. And um, it's really what we're all saying. It's about human connection. It's about passion. It's about community. And um, please, I encourage you, even if you're standing alone, remember you're in good company. Make the right decision. Ask the questions. Never Judge yourself. Never feel bad. Do not feel ashamed. If anybody in your family has struggle, everyone has struggle. Everyone. Everyone. It doesn't matter. Don't get in your own way. Reach out. Ask for help. And again, thank you all. And thank you to the panel. And um, if you wouldn't mind, Jasmine and Elisa are going to hand out these. You don't have to do them. Oh, wait, I should not say it like that. Okay, we have a RAND survey from the Department of Mental Health, but they are voluntary, so you don't have to do it. But if you want to fill them out, I think it's like six questions, and it's to monitor what we're doing for the Department of Mental Health and what's going on. So feel free to fill it out. It's not required. Please take coffee and sugar because I'm all about that, and it's out there. And if any of you would like to grab a hoodie or anything we have out there, please, it's yours to take. and. If your kids need anything and tonight wasn't the night to ask the question or a family member, reach out. We are always available. And uh, drive home safe and have a really good night. And I Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.